Pong. Originally released in 1972 Pong entered into arcades. Two years later it was introduced as the first commercially successful video game released by Atari. The game was so successful that Magnavox Odyssey attempted to sue Atari for creating a similar game to theirs. It uses a basic construct and is based off of the game's tennis and ping pong, with a dotted line separating the middle. Players control paddles to hit a square ball back and forth. As the game progresses the ball moves faster increasing the difficulty. The game was so successful that the prototype broke down within a few days because it was overfilled with quarters. The money-making machine became the most important game ever created. Well, thank you for being here. I know there are many of our friends watching from the other side of that camera uh, on our Potential Church app or website that are preparing for their watch party. I want to welcome all of our campuses that are joining us. It's not just us here in Cooper City. We have uh, campuses in uh, Lima, Peru, in Hallandale Beach, Florida, and Pensacola, Florida. So we love you guys. We're thankful that you've joined us as well. And it's going to be an amazing weekend. I've loved this arcade series. Have you loved it? It's been so good. You know, week one, Pastor Troy brought an amazing word about Pac-Manning the past. Week two, the, the game was Donkey Kong. The theme was Saving the Princess, talked about achieving goals and success. Last week, Pastor Troy talked about the game Tetris and talked about financial breakthrough. It was one of the best messages that I've ever heard on generosity, financial breakthrough. And if you're in this room and you are struggling financially and you have not heard last week's message, I encourage you download our Potential Church app, go to our website, find that teaching, watch it. I know it will impact your life. And this week, any guesses to the game that we're gonna be talking about? Pong, anybody like the game of Pong? Anybody hate the game of Pong because it's so frustrating? You know, Pong um, was really one of the first games to introduce this theme of, of conflict. And if you've never played the game Pong, I want to show you a quick clip. We're going to check it out. Um, you can see there's two opponents, and the object of the game is to shoot the Pong ball using your little, little stick thingy and to get it past your opponent, to one-up them, and that's how you score. And you can tell... The game gets faster, the Pong shoots harder, it becomes more aggressive, and it's meant not just for one player, but for two people. Well, today, I want to liken the game of Pong to our relationships. How many of you know that conflict is a natural reoccurring part of every relationship that we have, right? Even the good ones are not devoid of conflict. And you know, conflict doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Conflict can bring intimacy, conflict can bring closeness, but when not handled appropriately, conflict can also cause a lot of pain and damage and destruction. And I would say that many of us, when conflict arises, we use our words like a pong ball. Our, our goal is to shoot our words at the other person, to try and one-up them, to gain dominance in the conversation or the argument. And if we're not careful, our words become aggressive, they flow out of our mouths with us, out really even giving thought to what we're saying. And conflict is something that we can't avoid, but it is something that we have to learn how to deal with and how to deal with effectively. And I believe that God shows us a different way. You know, Pong it may have been the first game to introduce this idea of conflict to opponents coming against each other. But since then, there have been many, many video games that conflict is an overarching theme within the game. And one of my favorites is Street Fighter. Any Street Fighter fans in the house this morning? I like Street Fighter. Check this out. Conflict. A serious disagreement or argument, typically a protracted one. Conflict, a condition in which a person experiences a clash of opposing wishes or needs. Round 1, Fight! fight. Best shot. 
Come on, let's give it up for the team. Give it up for our fighters. You see, conflict is around every single corner. And like I said, I believe that God shows us a different way to deal with the arguments and the problems and the conflict that enters our life. So we're going to jump right into the word this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 4. James gives us um, some reasoning as to what causes conflict. And we're going to pick it up right in verse 1. It's going to be up on the screens as well so that you can follow along. James chapter 4 says this. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you so much for your word. And God, I pray over these next few moments, God, as I, as I speak, I pray that, that your word would come forth, that it would bring conviction, that it would bring healing, that it would bring understanding. God, I pray that every burden in our hearts be removed in this moment, every distraction from our minds, so that we can receive this word that you have for us. We commit this time to you. We worship you. We praise you. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen. I'm gonna do some sitting today because I'm actually, I've got some back pain. I pulled something earlier. And so I don't usually, when I preach, sit. And we'll see how long this lasts. Who knows, in two minutes, I could be on fire and be out there with you guys. But, um, but I'm gonna sit for now. And for those of you who don't know, I have a 15 month old son and he never sits. I mean, not even for a moment. Um, he's at that fun age where, He's exploring, and he has discovered that he has this thing called flesh, and his flesh wants what it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it, you know, um, and so he's discovering his independence, and, uh, and it's a fun age. You know, when they're newborn, let's be honest, newborns, they're really not even all that cute, are they? I mean, I know we say, oh, they're so precious, they're beautiful, but... We just say that. I mean, they're, they barely open their eyes. All their facial features are so, like, exaggerated. They don't get cute until later. And, um, you know, really, I, a newborn is kind of like a goldfish. You know, they don't do much other than cry, poop, and eat, you know? So I love this age. Now that he is walking, he has discovered more of what he likes to do, what he can do, and uh, it's, it's been fun. But he's been in this season uh, now where he doesn't want to sit in his high chair to eat. What he wants to do is get down from his high chair, and he wants his snacks, he doesn't want to sit down and eat full meals. He just wants to carry his snacks with him everywhere that he goes so that he can play, so that he can explore. And, um, it's, you know, as if you have kids, you know that these behaviors come on suddenly. One day he's fine with the high chair. The next day he's crying, he's screaming, and he takes his food and throws it on the floor for the dogs. And so we've been trying to teach him, no, lion, it's time to sit down and to eat. It's time to sit down, it's, it's lunch, it's dinner, don't throw the food on the floor. When you throw the food on the floor, we've you know, got a little wooden spoon, and when he does it, we just give him a nice whack. No, I'm kidding. It's more of just a little spat, just to teach him you know, that no, it's, it's time to sit down and eat. And I realized that I think the culprit and the problem is me, because I realized that I think he's picked up this behavior because he sees me standing up, walking around, snacking. That's really, honestly, I don't do a lot of sit down eating. I'm that person that's always on the go. There's always, and I, so a lot of times I find myself standing and eating. Just the other day, I was st standing right beside him. I said, I had a bowl of soup in my hand saying, see lion, daddy's eating. It's time to eat our food. Amber looks at me, she's like, you're standing up, sit down. I was like, oh yeah. Um, and so I, I think he's picked up this behavior from me. But nonetheless, the other day, we were uh, here at the church, and we were preparing for an event, so we were here a little bit early. And um, I, he, we were in the green room, and I, I, you know, was feeding him. And so, you know, I, I had the plate. He was sitting in his high chair, and I get a phone call. And so I step away for just a moment, and I look back at him, and I say, Lion, there's no dogs here to clean up the food, so don't you dare drop it on the floor. And I know he heard me, y'all. He looked at me like he heard me and understood what I was saying. So I walk away only to come back to find that not only has my son not eaten the food 
that I have prepared for him. He has actually thrown it. I mean, it's on the walls. It's on the furniture. It's on the floor. It is everywhere. He's covered in it. And he just looks at me and smiling. And I look at him and I said, lion, rock, grambling. That's bad. That is bad. And so I I discipline him. I get it. I set him down and I clean him up. I start cleaning the floors. I mean, I'm, I'm like scrubbing on my hands and feet. And then my mom enters the room. His Gigi. And Lion loves his Gigi. And Gigi loves Lion. It's amazing. When I was younger, you know, my parents told us, no, there was discipline. There was rules. For Lion, though, I mean, in 15 months, he has never heard the word no from his Gigi or his king. They give him whatever he wants. My mom can't even handle it when I tell him no. And so he, she walks into the room. Lion's face lights up. And he walks over to her. He gives her a hug. He gives her a kiss. And then he grabs her hand and he points to the snack counter and says, food? Food? And he walks his Gigi over to where the snacks are, trying to sucker her into giving him snacks. She walks over there and I look at her. I say, Gigi? I said, don't you do it. She turns back. She says, oh, but Tyler, he's hungry. He's hungry. I said, Gigi, don't make me whack you too. It's amazing that even at 15 months, my son knows what he wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it. And James tells us that's really where all conflict begins, right? He says, why are there quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it because of your own desires within you? It's our flesh. It's our skin. Can I tell you, I have discovered that my flesh wants what it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it. And often conflict results from my expectations not being met or my desires not being fulfilled. And when what I think should happen doesn't happen, when it doesn't transpire, when my expectations are not met, when my desires are not being fulfilled, somebody has to be blamed. And what I found is oftentimes that someone is not me, but it's someone else. And when I approach conflict, oftentimes I'm not thinking of the other person's feelings or emotions above my own. A lot of times we hear the phrases, right? I feel, I think, I just have to get this off my chest. All about us. We're consumed by our own emotions. We never give thought to the emotions of others. And I believe that God shows us a different way. You know, I've been reading this book on emotions. It's called Untangling Emotions, and it uh, really is a, a great book. And the whole theme of the book is that everything that we feel, good or bad, is in response to something we love or something that we value. Think about it. We may feel happy, right, when, let's say, we get a promotion, right? Because a promotion means an opportunity to earn more money, which means we can go on more family vacations. And we love our family. We value quality time. So we are happy when we get a promotion. Or we might feel angry when someone lies to us, let's say. Why? Well, well, we feel angry because we value that relationship, And now that relationship has been hindered because of a lie. So we feel angry. We might feel sad when someone we love or is close to us passes away because we love them. We value their presence in our lives. Everything we feel, good or bad, is in response to something that we love or something that we value. And when we're willing to work through these emotions, I think conflict takes a nasty turn when we're unwilling to filter through our emotions. But when we're willing to evaluate our emotions, to work through them, they show us, they reveal to us what we love, what we value, but also what we're withholding love and value from. I wrote it this way in my notes, unhealthy and unnecessary conflict results when I place a higher value on what pleases my flesh rather than what pleases God's heart. And if everything that we feel, every emotion that we feel is in response to what we love and value, then if our hearts are not aligned with Almighty God, then what flows from our heart will not be pleasing in the sight of God. And so I want to share three character traits 
that is essential for us to develop, to cultivate within us, that helps us lead through conflict. Because it's my prayer, it's my desire that every one of us, those of us here at our Cooper City campus, those at our other campuses, those watching online through the app, through the website, on Facebook, watch, that we would be committed to leading through conflict, not just tolerating conflict, not just responding to conflict, but leading through conflict. And the first character trait I want to talk about when it comes to leading through conflict is vulnerability. In order to resolve conflict, we have to lead with vulnerability. Now, this is a hard one. The word vulnerable comes from two root words, able and wound. In other words, vulnerability is the ability to share our wounds, to be open with our wounds, And you know, it's really the only thing that allows us to enter into the emotions of someone else. And what if, in the heat of the moment, we made the choice to be more focused on resolving the conflict rather than fixing the problem? Those are two separate things. You see, oftentimes I find we don't get vulnerable in times of conflict because we never slow down enough. We are focused on using our words as a pong ball. How can I get my point across? Oh, they said something that hurts me. How can I hurt them? How can I one-up them? How can I attack them? And then we use our words to attack rather than to heal. But see, being vulnerable recognizes that there's a difference between resolving the conflict and fixing the problem. And I wonder what would happen in our relationships if we were more committed to resolving the conflict rather than fixing the problem. See, God is showing me that some problems can't be fixed overnight. Some problems require follow-up conversations. Some problems require big decisions. Some problems take seasons to work out. Now, if you're anything like me, I like my problems to be solved before dinner. Anybody else like that? You want all your problems to be solved before dinner so that I can enjoy dinner, so I can go to sleep, I can rest my head on my pillow, have a great night's sleep, and wake up and do it all again tomorrow. But we know life is not like that. Some problems can't be fixed in a moment, but to remain in conflict with someone that we love or someone that God has put in our life is always a choice. Being vulnerable recognizes that there's a difference between trying to fix the problem and resolving the conflict. We gotta be willing to get vulnerable. We gotta be willing to get vulnerable. And I think about vulnerability, I think about Jesus, because Jesus was not afraid to be vulnerable. And why was that? Why did Jesus live such an open life? Well, I think it's because he wasn't afraid of being taken advantage of. I think many times that's why we don't get vulnerable. It's risky to be vulnerable, because what if we get taken advantage of? What if somebody uses our own feelings against us? What if they use our words against us? But see, what if we lived like Jesus and we didn't have that fear of being taken advantage of? See, Jesus, he was secure in his mission and in his calling. He was secure in who he was. He was secure in the reason to which God sent him to earth. Therefore, he was not afraid of being taken advantage of, and he often was. I mean, even on his way to the cross, he was humiliated. Yet he never spoke a word against his accusers. He never defended himself. He never lashed out. See, Jesus valued the well-being of those around him rather than his own comfort. And that's not an easy decision to make. It's a selfless decision to choose to be vulnerable, to choose to be open to give people access to hurt us. It's a choice and it's not an easy choice. But can I tell you, when we make that choice to be vulnerable, to live an open life, it draws other people to us. And you know what? You can only live life for yourself for so long before that gets old, before it gets boring. I mean, we see that in the lives of celebrities. They have the fame, the status, the connections, the clothes, the cars, the money. But it's never enough because living for yourself is, is never truly satisfying. You know, God said uh, to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul was in conflict with himself. Sometimes the greatest kind of conflict is the conflict within. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And three times he begged God to take it away. And listen to God's response to Paul. 
He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul says it, I am willing to be vulnerable. I'm willing to share my wounds so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And church, I wonder what would happen if we made the decision to be more vulnerable in our relationships so that Christ's power could rest on us. I've experienced what it's like when when the power of Christ rests on you. And I can feel his presence and his presence changes us. It changes our perspective. It changes our emotions. So are we gonna be willing to lead with vulnerability? What does vulnerability practically look like? It looks like dealing with it quickly. Keeping a short list of offenses. You know, we say that a lot uh, here at Potential Church. Part of our staff, our staff culture is we say, keep your list short. If you have an offense with somebody, no matter if it's big or small, you go to that person, you talk it out, you get vulnerable, you share how you have been offended. Not to attack them, not to embarrass them, but to share, to help them understand how their actions made you feel. Keep your list short. Don't let it boil up on the inside of you. Don't bury it. Don't brush it under the rug because you're afraid of how they'll respond or you're afraid of the the drama that will stir up or maybe you just don't want to deal with their response or their anger. I encourage you, keep your list short. Deal with it quickly because when we let it fester, when we let it boil on the inside of us, what happens is, There's got to come a time for all of that to erupt. And what I found is when it erupts, it's never at a good time. Oftentimes what causes us to erupt, it really isn't even that big of a deal in the first place. It's just that everything has festered on the inside of us. Keep your list short. Vulnerability also looks like dealing with it privately. You know, when my wife and I uh, were were engaged, we uh, did premarital counseling and the counselor told us warned us really uh, to be very careful that during this season where we're engaged, where you know, we've not yet come together as one, we're still, we were both living um, at home with our parents at the time. She encouraged us to be very careful that when you argue, argue or when you fight or when there's conflict in your relationship, be careful about how much of the dirty details you share with your family. Be very, very careful, she said, because I see so many people that come in here and they have a really difficult time reconciling their relationship, not because they haven't forgiven each other, but the people they've shared the drama with haven't forgiven their partner. And it makes it really, really challenging to move forward in the relationship. You know what, sometimes we gotta be careful about involving those that have no business being in our relationship. And I know that they love you, but listen, I think what happens a lot of times is people have difficulty empathizing with our situation. They imagine what it would be like for them rather than imagining what it is like for us. And so they may, out of good intentions, give ungodly advice or ungodly wisdom. So we gotta be careful about involving a whole bunch of people in our conflict. Go to that person directly. That means, husbands, when you are fighting with your wife and she is nagging you. You don't get together with the boys and bash her name. Ladies, it means that when you're going through a difficult season in your marriage with your husband, you're not getting together over brunch with your girlfriends, talking about, oh, I wish he was like like your husband. I wish he was like this man. I wish he did this better. I w-. No, it means honoring that person, even in the midst of conflict, in dealing with it privately. Now, I'm not saying you don't find a trusted confidant, whether it's a friend or a counselor or a mentor, to be real about what you're struggling with. But it does mean that you gotta be very, very careful who you share it with. Are we willing to lead with vulnerability if we're gonna resolve conflict? My next question is, are we willing to lead with empathy? Empathy says, I wanna understand what this is like for you rather than imagining what it is like or would be like for me. It puts us in the shoes of another, and it is such a strength in our relationships. I don't know about you, but I'm secure enough to admit that my perspective is limited. It's limited by my own experiences, my own opinions, my own wounds. It's bias. My perspective is bias. It will always be limited. That's why in Proverbs, the wisdom writers tells us, do not lean on your own what? 
understanding. Don't lean on your own opinions. Don't lean on your own way of thinking. Don't lean only on what makes sense to you, but in all your ways, acknowledge God. Take to God your emotions. Take, take to God your opinions before you share them. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? Direct your paths. He will straighten out your paths. And when I look to the life of Christ, I see that not only was Christ willing to be vulnerable, but he was eager to empathize. You could even say that Jesus himself is empathy incarnate. I mean, John 1 tells us that the word became flesh. See, Jesus didn't enter into existence upon his birth as a human baby. Jesus has always existed. He's part of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have always been since before the beginning of time. But Jesus was sent as a baby in human form. Why? He didn't have to do it that way. But he did it to walk in our shoes, to feel what we feel, to experience what we experience. John 1 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The message translation says it like this. I love it. That, that Jesus moved into the neighborhood and he made a home among his people. Jesus walked in our shoes. He felt every temptation that we feel. He felt every, every frustration, every pain. Jesus felt it. And it's that empathy that I believe further motivated his compassion that ultimately led him to the cross to sacrifice his life for my life. Jesus empathized. Jesus empathized. And, you know, empathy is really what motivates unconditional love. You can't truly love someone past their flaws until you first seek to understand why those flaws exist. We love because he first loved us. And Paul writes it like this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, you know what? I can preach, I can lead, I can empower, I can be generous, I can prophesy even, but if I don't love others and truly love them unconditionally, then I've gained nothing. And then he goes on to say, these three things remain. He says, prophecy will disappear. Knowledge will disappear. Everything in this lifetime will disappear, but these three remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, he says, is love. And not a surface level love. Not a love that comes to us or comes to others when, when we're kicked down and discouraged and defeated. It's not a love that just says, oh, I'll keep you in my prayers. And then keeps that person at arm's length. It is a love that we all need from time to time when we're kicked down, when we're discouraged, when we've been knocked off our feet. It is a love that comes to us, that leans down and picks us up and carries us on the journey when we don't have the strength to walk it out for ourselves. And there comes a time in all of our lives that we need those kind of people. But can I tell you, that only comes from an unconditional love. You're only willing to get down and pick somebody up and carry them yourself when you love them past their flaws. But to love them past their flaws, you first have to seek to understand why those flaws exist. The moment when conflict arises, we gotta be willing to enter into the emotions of someone else. You know, when Amber and I argue how selfish of me to be more focused on her agreeing with my perspective rather than being concerned about the condition of her heart, and when that happens, when I refuse to empathize, it creates a drift in our relationship. And drift leads to separation. And you know what? Sometimes it feels good to separate ourselves from those that just push every single one of our buttons and we're fed up and we're done with. We're really good about that. Uh, just humanity in general about cutting people off saying I'm done with them, I'm fed up, I'm sick, I'm tired, therefore I am going to separate myself from you. And even though it gratifies our flesh and feels good in a moment, it is not the heart of our God. Galatians 6.2, he commands us, share each other's burdens. And in this way, you obey the law of Christ. Romans 12.15 he says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who are weep. Regardless of what I'm feeling, God calls me to be joyful with those who are joyful. Regardless of what I feel about that person, God commands me to weep 
with those who weep, to enter into the emotions of others. It is the truest expression of love. And if loving others more deeply and desperately is of no concern to you, then my heart breaks for you. Because I hate to tell you this, but I think you're gonna live a lonely and purposeless existence if loving others more deeply is of no concern to you. It's actually an attack on your identity as a child of God, right? We love because he first loved us. That's who we are. That's what makes us children of God. And so we gotta be willing to, to lead with empathy. What does empathy look like practically? It means choosing to question methods, but not motives. It's okay to question the methods of someone else. Hey, I don't think you handled this the best way. Hey, I don't think you, you, you used the right words. What you said really hurt my feelings. It really offended me. But when we start saying, well, I know why you did that. I know why you said that. We cross the line to disloyalty and disloyalty always comes before pain and destruction. See, the moment that I make an accusation that I know what's going on in the depths of another person's heart is the moment I take the focus off of the issue and I put it on my own pride. You see, there's something in our human flesh. We love to think that we can read other people really well, don't we? I promise you, so many of you, when you go for a job interview and they ask you, well, what are some of your strengths? You don't have to answer this out loud, but how many of you said, well, I am really good at reading people. Can I tell you, I've heard it from almost every single candidate I've ever interviewed. They say this, they say, it is amazing. People can walk into the room and in a moment, I already know like what's going on with them. I can read them. I, 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 can, I, can, say, I can just discern what's going on with that person. And you know what? We gotta be really careful about that in our relationships. Because the moment we make an accusation about what's going on in the depths of someone's heart and we question their why, then all of a sudden, every single thing that they do starts to annoy us and frustrate us and make us bitter. Because we're not dealing with the issue, we're dealing with matters of, of the heart. Can I tell you, that's how divorce happens so often is that people make assumptions, they make accusations. Empathy means choosing to question methods but not question motives. You know, a great practice that we can implement in our relationships, even today, is using these words when conflict arises. This is what I'm hearing, is this what you're saying? Because there might be a difference in what you're hearing and what the other person is trying to communicate. And not only does it help them better communicate, and give voice to what they're really trying to say, but it also shows that person that you're not just listening to them, you're hearing them. If we're gonna resolve conflict in the way that God intends, we gotta lead with vulnerability, lead with empathy, and where I wanna end us today is lead with humility. You know, it's no big secret that healthy, thriving relationships require humility. Humility is what motivates us to say the words, I'm sorry, and actually mean it. Not just saying I'm sorry to end the conversation. Not saying I'm sorry with an attitude or just trying to appease someone. Not just saying I'm sorry to settle the drama, but saying sorry and meaning it in the depths of our heart. You know, in a marriage, I believe that the words I'm sorry are even more powerful than the words I love you. You know, my wife, she, um, she likes to watch reality TV. It's her guilty pleasure. I've I had never watched reality TV um, until we got married, but now I think I'm hooked because I find, I find people, why they do what they do and what makes them tick so interesting. I mean, it really intrigues me. And we were watching this, <coughs> this reality show and there was a fight, a big, big, you know, lash out uh, between these two, these two people. And they were friends um, and there was an issue. They lashed out at each other. And then later one of them goes and attempts to apologize. They pull them aside. Hey, can I talk to you for a second? And they go on to say, they say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for what I did, but let me explain why I did it. You made me feel this way. You didn't handle this correctly. And that's why I did what I did. But, but, but I guess I'm sorry about it. Now, I understand this is reality TV 
And if the drama was handled correctly, nobody would make any money and we wouldn't watch. I get it. But I was thinking about it. I was like, you know what? If that person on that show had just gone to the person that they offended and said, you know what? I'm sorry. Not I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, period. I care about you. I care about your well-being. And yes, there is an issue at hand and we need to deal with that. But let's separate that. Let me tell you that I am sorry that I offended you. Will you please forgive me? And let me help you out. If, if your apology is followed by a but or an explanation, then it's not an apology at all. A true apology begins and ends with I'm sorry, period. I'm sorry. Some of us, we just need to humble ourselves and apologize. Not get fired up about how we have a reason to be mad. We have a reason to be upset. And we have a reason to have said the words that we said. So often we justify and explain our actions rather than owning up to them. And I just, can I, I, I want to encourage you that that is insecurity. Secure, confident people don't have to explain their actions. They own up to their actions, whether they be good or bad. And I want to encourage us to not be afraid to apologize and to really mean it, to lay down our dagger of vengeance so that we can pick up our sword of the Spirit. Because you can't hold on to your dagger of vengeance, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, and hold your sword of the Spirit at the same time. You have to choose. Let me ask you, is it worth it? Is it worth holding on to that dagger? I don't know. You're, you may be saying, you don't know my story. You don't know my situation. You don't know what my spouse did to me. You don't know the words that they said to me. And you're right. You know what? I don't know your situation. But what I do know is that the longer you yourself are unwilling to lead with vulnerability, to lead with empathy, to lead with humility, the greater the divide will be. And God has given you, my friend, you. He's given you the power to lead with those traits. So are we going to choose to be vulnerable? Are we going to choose to empathize? Are we going to choose to humble ourselves before God so that we can humble ourselves before others? You know, the greatest conflict in the history of the world is the conflict between God and man. We read about it in the Old Testament, right? Adam and Eve were in the garden. God told them you can eat any fruit anywhere in the garden. And they picked the one fruit that God told them not to eat. I always think of that fruit as being an apple. Now there's not great context or great evidence that it was an apple, but I, I always just visualize it. And you know what? Apples are not even that good unless there's peanut butter. So I don't know why the fall of man depended upon an apple that didn't even have peanut butter, but that's beside the case. <clears throat> they chose to eat the fruit, and that's when sin entered the world. And God knew, God knew that the people he loves will continually break his heart. The Israelites, his chosen people, we read about it. They we're all about God in some seasons, but then they'd turn away from him. They would worship false gods. They would shame his name. They would complain to him. They would blame him for their unfortunate circumstances. You know, there's actually, we read, there are passages in the Old Testament where God actually says that he's sorry he ever made them. So we see that God's heart was broken time and time again by the very people that he created and he loves. But what did God do? God chose not to abandon us. God chose to make a way where there was no way. God himself led with vulnerability, with empathy, and even humility. And he said, I'm going to send my one and only son as a sacrifice for their wickedness so that they don't have to be separated from me, so that they can be reconciled to me. So God sent Jesus to earth and Jesus performed miracles and signs and wonders and he preached 
the word of the gospel, he preached this message of grace, that there's forgiveness and cleansing for the sins of man. And then he went to the cross. He died. He cried out the words, it is finished. He was placed in a tomb and then he was resurrected to life again three days later so that we could be reconciled in our relationship to God the Father. You know, that's why I don't believe in irreconcilable differences. We hear that word a lot in Hollywood, right? When celebrities get divorced, they call it irreconcilable differences. I don't believe in irreconcilable differences because if God the Father can reconcile someone as sinful, as shameful, as disgusting, as screwed up as me to himself through his one and only son, then there is no such thing as irreconcilable differences. And we see that reflected in the heart of God. And I want to encourage us today, are we, are we going to make the decision for ourselves? This message isn't for the person sitting next to you. This message is for you. How are you going to lead through conflict? Will you bow your heads with me? You know, we can never deal with conflict appropriately until we have allowed God to transform our hearts. And there are some of us in this room that we believe that there is a God. We even believe that Jesus went to the cross, died for our sins, rose three days later, awesome. But you haven't repented for the sinfulness that is in your own heart. You're living life your own way, not according to God's word. You, you live by your emotions, you get angry, you use words that tear down, that destroy, words that are vulgar, profanity. We live life based on our career. We're not committed to church. We're not committed to, to, to reaching others with the good news of Christ. We're focused on our promotion, on our career path, sleeping with people that we're not married to, being promiscuous, finding that all those things, getting the fame, getting the, the CEO position, getting the, the promotion, there's still something that's empty. There's a void inside of us. And friend, that's because you were created by Almighty God in His image. And you were made to reflect the heart of God. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, guiding you, directing you, transforming you, there will be a void in your heart and you will always try and fill it with the wrong things. And I promise you, there is no, no amount of sex, drugs, alcohol, Bitterness, anger, nothing will fill that void the way that Jesus can. And so if you've never allowed yourself to be transformed by the power of the cross, I, I wanna lead you in a word of prayer and it's a simple prayer. But the scriptures teach us that anyone who speaks with their mouth, believes in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, they will be saved meaning that Jesus will enter your heart, the Holy Spirit will dwell on the inside of you and guide you and direct you and straighten out your paths. And if that's you, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. You don't have to say the same words, but that it's important that your heart desires the same thing. And we're gonna say this every person in the room, because I don't wanna single out anyone that has never prayed this prayer. I want you to feel comfortable in this. So we're all gonna say together, say, Father, I am a sinner. I have messed up. I am so sorry. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus went to the cross, died, and was resurrected for my sin. Allow that truth to transform my heart. I repent for my sin. Help me to turn away from it. Save me. Salvage me, rescue me, be my Lord and be the master of my life. And then in your own way, thank him for that gift of salvation, for that gift of redemption. The word teaches that if you prayed that prayer and you believed in your heart and you're serious about wanting to turn from your sin and chase after the things of God, the scriptures teach that there's a celebration right now in heaven because it means that when your days on earth are finished, you will not spend an eternity separated from God, but you will join with him in heaven. So thank him, God, we thank you for the beautiful gift of salvation. 
And then I want to pray for another group of people. I want to pray for, for, the, for marriages to be restored in this place. Because marriage is a big deal. God refers to the church as his bride. Our marriage is to reflect the church of Christ. And God takes it seriously. When he says, till death do you part, he means it. Divorce, separation, staying together for the kids, that is not God's will for your marriage. God wants your marriage to thrive, to be fruitful, to bring you great joy and happiness. But I understand many of us are not there. And whether your spouse is here or not here, will you just stand with me for a moment as a sign of surrenderance? Stand with me right now in this moment. And if your spouse is here with you, will you just grab their hand as a sign of unity? Would you just grab their hand to say, you know what, we're gonna put unity above being right in this, in this situation? And I don't know what you're going through. I know you're angry. I know you're mad. Maybe you argued on the way to church. Maybe you've just been bickering lately. Maybe you haven't spent any quality time. Or maybe it's more serious than that. Maybe you have experienced the ultimate betrayal. Maybe you carry such a burden of guilt in your heart. But just grab their hand and squeeze their hand. Maybe if you feel comfortable, wrap your arms around them. But, but join together with your spouse as a sign of unity to say what God brought together, the enemy dare not try and separate. And, and do that as a symbol symbolic, physical, tangible symbol that the enemy is not going to have his way in your marriage. Father God, I cover these marriages right now. I rebuke the enemy from these marriages, God. I send him out, God. I command him to leave in the name of Jesus. I command him to flee and to retreat and to drop his weapon and to drop his arrows in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would give these husbands and these wives the courage to lead with vulnerability, to lead with empathy and to lead with humility, God, especially the husbands. Because God, as a man, I know how often our ego and our pride gets in the way of true joy and happiness in relationships. And God, I ask that these men would be men of God, would be warriors willing to lead through conflict, not be passive through it. God, I pray that these marriages be restored, God, where there's been betrayal, where there's been hurt, where there's been bitterness, where there's been pride. I pray that that would be broken down right now by the Holy Spirit. As we just linger in your presence, God, speak to us, God. Speak to us. Give us your wisdom. Your word says that pride comes before the fall, but humility brings forth wisdom. I pray that as we humble ourselves before you, that you would bring wisdom. God, I pray for for the husbands and wives who stand alone, who don't have their spouse with them. And maybe it's just because they're at home sick. Maybe it's because their spouse is not a believer and they never attend church with them and they pray daily. God, I pray that you would remind them in this moment that they don't have to shove it in their spouse's face. All they have to do is plant the seeds and trust that you'll water those seeds. I declare that the seeds that they have planted and the seeds that they are going to plant shall not fall on deaf ears. It shall not fall on the dirt, rocky path, but it shall fall upon soil that will be watered and bring forth fruit in the name of Jesus. I pray that they would lead with vulnerability, with empathy, and with humility, and may their spouse see you reflected in their heart. You may be seated. God, we thank you that you are working in our lives, that you are working through us, God. And I pray that today be a fresh start. Fresh start, that's the good news. You are the God of the new. And because Jesus went to the cross, he offered us salvation, not just for a moment, not just for eternity, but he continually offers us salvation and redemption. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your precious son's name that we pray. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Give God a hand clap if you know he's been good to you, amen.